So again, thank you so much for joining us, choosing to be here. I'm Denise Shante. go by she, her pronouns. I'm the CarePod lead for our Design Justice Network. I am a black femme with natural curly hair, wearing a white shirt, a tattoo sleeve, and a blue necklace and brown glasses. I thank you all for joining, welcoming, however it is that you're showing up, your grief, your joy, your curiosity about how we're entering this space. This particular care session is really calling attention to us designing the worlds that we want and knowing that there will never be a world without conflict, but how can we learn how to hold the multiplicity of our differences in ways that are generative, playful, and authentic. And so this topic of conflict is being explored through play, which is or was an unexpected pivot in connection to the topic that we're excited Minachi brought into this experience. And so more agency, communication, body awareness, this joyful play and curiosity are some of the guiding forces that will happen throughout our gathering. For our flow, we're starting off with this welcome. We will have some check-ins and breakouts. We'll also enter about 90 minutes or so with Minachi on this topic, Framing Conflict as Play. We'll take a break. We'll come back with the Care Circle conversation, and then we will close with announcements and farewells. For our access supports today. In the chat support, um, you'll notice our slide deck link. So we keep that open and it's editable because we'll have some interactive moments. And this is also supporting the async participation. So you can reference all the prompts that are happening and you'll also have access to these slides after the gathering along with the recording. For chat support, if any questions come up, please give one of the facilitators time to respond via chat or audio. And if you want your message to be read in the chat, something that we started doing is to put read before your message so that we know you're okay with that being read out loud. ASL interpreters. Elijah is spotlit right now and we'll move between Elijah Ayers and Amanda Briggs. And you can pin them also on your own at any time on your screen. During the breakout activities, we're gonna create a group that will include ASL interpretation. You can indicate that you would like to be in the ASL room now by putting a star next to your name or by staying back in the main room when we enter those sessions so we can make sure that you're added in that ASL breakout. For breakout rooms and the break that we're having, so we'll have a 10 minute breakout to check in with each other at the beginning of the session. And you will also have the option to go into a quiet room for personal reflection instead. Please message Victoria if you would like this option. And then we'll also have a five minute break and a 10 minute break. For live transcription, this has been turned on via Zoom and you can also enable it at the bottom of your screen. We will have emotional support. We have Miro who's here holding the support role and Miro will have an introduction and share more later. And this is something that we'll offer throughout each gathering and we'll expand upon in a moment. And show up as you are. Feel free to take any additional breaks that you need, have your camera on or off, move around your space, get comfortable, whatever it is that you need to tend to your body. What is the DJN care pod? So right now we're defining this as a soft regenerative space for dreaming and designing liberatory cultures of care. Through virtual gatherings and online offline togetherness, we experiment with how the lineages of care and healing justice might shape the way that we design more just community-led worlds. We're holding space as a team. We have our DJN care pod that is co-facilitated and held by me. 
Next slide, please. DJ and CarePod lead and CarePod collaborators, Jody and Kalina, who will also be introduced later. We have emotional support with Miro. SK being held as a body, mind, peer supporter. And if you find yourself wanting to meeting that processing space through messages or one-on-one in a private room, please send a direct message to Miro. Going to give space for Miro to come on and share a little bit about this support. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here with you all. Um, I'm Miro. My pronouns are they, them. For a visual description of myself, I am a white bodied non binary femme uh, wearing a ball cap, um, buzzed hair moth inspired dramatic eyebrows and a baby blue tank top and a black um, rain kind of trench coat today. Um, I am here because we recognize that as our bodies carry the marks of the oppressive systems we gather to upend today, um, that connecting to our bodies through somatic practices, especially in the context of, of conflict, um, and within community can at times bring up unexpected emotions, sensations, and memories that can be difficult to process in a group setting. So I'm here to offer compassionate one-to-one -one space via breakout rooms or chat to affirm, validate, and process whatever may pro uh, present for you today. So during the meeting, I'll be adding support by way of any questions or kind of noticing and information via the chat as well as um, uplifting messages from the community within the chat. I'm really grateful to be here with you today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mero. We have tech support being held by Victoria, our tech wizard for today, and also a beloved DJN legacy person, a member, supporter, all the things. So we're glad that Victoria is able to be here with us during these gatherings. And also we have our guest and somatic healing practitioner, Minachi. She will be introduced more fully later and guiding us through part one of framing conflict as play. Before we get into the breadth and depth of these gatherings, we wanna just have a grounding moment. As a way to land here now, I'm inviting in a simple yet soothing grounding five, four, three, two, one technique that focuses on the senses and can also bring you and your body back to the present moment. And if entering one of the senses feels inaccessible, I invite you to just focus on your breath throughout this, these next, this next minute or so. The first moment is to look around your environment and to yourself begin to name five things that you can see. Five things that you can see in your space wherever you are. And if you can now shift your focus on four things that you can feel. Maybe it's temperature. Maybe it's an interior feeling. Then notice three things that you can hear around you. What are two things that you can maybe smell right now?
scent as memory and connection. And lastly, focusing on one thing that you can taste. And if you can't taste anything, I invite you to imagine tasting something that you really, really enjoy. Taking a breath, extending gratitude to our bodies, remembering that these moments of sensation and connection are something that we can come back to. It's a technique that's subtle enough to where you can often practice it anywhere in your space and comfort and privacy and can also return to throughout our gathering. I'm gonna to transition to Karina who is guiding us through our breakout rooms and check-in. Hi folks, my name is Karina and I'm the CarePod collaborator that Denise Shante mentioned earlier. A visual description of myself is I have a bald head, uh, quite white skin to be honest, despite it being summer, um, and some glasses and some jewelry uh, that's hanging from my neck, some silver chain jewelry. And I also have a lot of rings if my hands start talking with my mouth, which happens. So today we're going to be doing a breakout and we're going to be doing this breakout um, inspired by an experience that I had years ago with a gallerist and artist named Terrence B. Jackson, who was running a space called U Space Art Gallery. And there was an exhibit and the exhibit asked folks, what are five things you know to be true? And so this question today is inspired by that moment and the way that that question lingered in me. We're going to be doing group check-ins in smaller breakout rooms. We've created a group that will be including ASL interpretation as mentioned earlier, if you didn't already indicate that you would like to be in the ASL room, please do so and send a private message to Victoria so that we're able to add you to that ASL breakout room. And that's also true for the quiet room. Please do let Victoria know if that's something that you'll want to do as we are about to break out into this check-in space. Today, we're highlighting the six design justice principle. And that principle is, we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. We brought this forward with our theme of conflict navigation through play because we really wanted to ground folks in the fact that we believe everyone here today and those joining later do know some things about conflict. And so that's how we're beginning with that knowledge that we have experience with conflict and that as we move through the learnings and the practices and the conversations, what we're doing is we're learning and unlearning, but we're not entering with nothing there. While we break out, we want you to sit with this question, as I mentioned before, what is one thing that you know to be true about conflict? You'll have 10 minutes to chat with each other before we return and continue. I just need one more second. Thank you. And Victoria is going to be breaking folks out into rooms. So again, this is a moment where if you do want to be in either the ASL room or in the quiet room, which basically means that you have some space to kind of sit with yourself, um, you can let Victoria know now. And we're going to be sending you off in a moment. So 
feel free to make sure that you're in a comfortable space as we check in. This is our kind of grounding and entering into today. And just gonna name, we're so happy that you're here. Hello everyone. Welcome back to the main room. You had a moment to connect with some other folks who are here today for this gathering. Um, my name is Jody. I'm one of the CarePod collaborators and um, just give a quick visual description of myself. Um, I'm an East Asian non-binary person um, with long black hair tied up in kind of a spiky bun on top of my head today. Um, I'm surrounded by some plant friends and some sunlight um, and I'm wearing a bright red cozy hoodie. Um, and I'm really excited and really grateful um, to introduce Minachi as our guest practitioner today, um, who will be leading, leading us through the session on framing conflict as play um, in a few moments. And um, I will read her bio to introduce her. So <clears throat> Minachi, she, her, um, is a somatic healing practitioner whose work centers social change and embodied transformation. Using the modalities of nonviolent communication with a decolonial lens and family constellation therapy, Minachi guides individual and group practices, which equip participants with tools to articulate their truth and to release ancestral trauma, which was never theirs to carry. Minachi holds a clinical license in occupational therapy and has historically served communities impacted by gender-based violence, complex trauma, and serious mental illness. She is the author of Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication um, from 2019. And we're so, yeah, we're so glad to have you here. And I will pass it over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's really sweet to be with you. Um, my name is Minachi. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have brown skin and my hair is black down to about my shoulders. I am wearing big goofy glasses, my green scarab earrings, and a yellow sweatshirt that I love that says Habibi Mon Amour. So I'm gonna take us in to a little bit of what we're gonna be doing today. Um, we'll have some instructional content, some journaling prompts, a break, and then another breakout room discussion. So some notes on this. The break is going to be about a five minute break and we'll play with it kind of fluidly. Uh, we'll assess where the energy is in the room as I'm moving through content and probably somewhere around the hour mark, meaning the hour from where we started is where I'm holding to take that break. There's going to be a few different journaling prompts, and I would guess that they're going to range from 15 to 20 minutes in total. So something to take note of if it is a, a hard joint day, you don't have to journal, you can color or you can take a voice note, um, whatever feels good for you to process those questions. And then the instructional content, y'all get ready because basically what you're going to be invited into is the maze of my mind. So with that said, I'm going to take us in. So the intention of this session is to really allow a gentle introduction into the waters of what do we think about conflict? How do we hold conflict? What are our strengths and growth edges? And also how can we begin to play with it a little bit, play with, you know, not just the way that we hold conflict or think about it, but also engage with it. So a chat thread invitation is what is one hope or intention that brought you here today? I'll invite you to share it into the chat. And also if you can put read the word read with it, that will let me know that you're comfortable with having it read out loud. So I'm going to hold here for a little bit while those come in. To learn more. To learn more how to navigate and experience conflict. Ease. To learn some alternate frameworks to cancel culture. 
to face control or lack thereof, to explore in safety. Some of them are moving faster than I can read out loud, so I probably won't read all of them. For conflict to become a word that I'm not afraid of. These are really beautiful. I'm gonna invite folks to continue dropping those in and to review them or read them as you're able to. Mm. I'm exhausted with racism and the patriarchy and I need other resources and help. Thank you for the shares. I'm gonna take us back into the maze. So, when we were brainstorming, kind of like, what are we going to do with this session? We're looking at the principles. This one really resonated, right? We believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a process. And in our planning meeting, I like referenced this and I was like, because we all know what how we want things to go in conflict. And we had a big group laugh because it's also true that we don't know how things like once conflict hits the fan, it's like we're all kind of like helpless trying to figure things out, however much theory we understand. So I want to introduce first, right, this idea that we all come from lineages that have navigated conflict. And there can be a lot of complexity to this to think about like some of us are coming from lineages that have actively created conflict. Others are feeling like we're coming from lineages that have really survived and are struggling to make it through conflict. And however messy, nuanced, or complex those histories have been, and particularly when we think about the families of origin that we come from and the skills that we did or didn't obtain, Sometimes there can be a sense of, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get it through and everything is against me. And something that I'm going to invite you to consider both now and as we move through this is that even in the mess, there are gems of wisdom. Even if everything, every quote, quote skill you've learned doesn't feel effective or doesn't seem to get you where it is that you want to be with the quality of ease or softness or connection, there is still really deep information within your body and within your lineage that is present that we can resource as we explore different ways of connecting with each other. So then where my brain went is actually thinking about the root of the word conflict. I am a word nerd and there's a lot of information in etymology about like how words came to be and what do they actually mean and, and how do we use them? So I did a Google and conflict comes from this Latin root that means to strike together. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because presumably it's kind of like, you know, like two swords or two staffs or something like that striking against each other. But if we just think about to strike together, that's a lot of what movement building is and cultural work and organizing. It's this question of how can we come together so that we are striking in unison, in collaboration and in one kind of like movement together. I was like, oh, that's very beautiful to think about how can we strike together as opposed to in dissonance. And then my brain started to travel into our bodies, right? And polyvagal theory was probably one of the first um, uh, pieces of scientific evidence that was like really, really enlightening and really, really interesting. So I really like to talk about it as like a root resource. Um, so it was developed by Dr. Stephen Porges, who's a neuroscientist, and then really embellished and supported, I don't know if embellished is the right word, uh, expanded <laughs> by the work of Deb Dana, um, who is a therapist. And again, as much of a geek as we can get about some of these sciencey things, again, one of the things that I want to share and remind folks, a lot of the clinical interventions that emerged from polyvagal theory are practices that were already commonplace and standard healing things within indigenous cultures. So a lot of what polyvagal theory teaches us is that um, music and song is deeply healing. Also that rhythmic movement and dance are important for re-regulating the body. 
that breath work and strategies for breathing, and also that people need environments where they feel safe in order to be able to access a sense of healing. So again, as we go through this work, if there are any light bulbs or aha moments that you experience, it's an invitation to remember that that was information. It's not new information to you. It's actually information that your body already knew that you're just coming home to your own wisdom. So polyvagal theory has to do with the vagus nerve. There's 10 or uh, 13 nerves that originate in the body. And the vagus nerve is the 10th one. And it touches many different regions of the body. I'm going to invite you to touch these body parts with me if that feels good for you. So it starts in your head, in your brain. So go ahead and touch that. It makes contact with your ears, with your face. with your throat, with your lungs and your heart space, and then with your gut, your genitals, your bowel, your sacral area. So I'm just gonna invite you to pause here and take a moment to notice if you feel more or less grounded after making contact with those different body parts and just this slow, gentle, simple connection. I personally, even those simple touches feel a lot more rooted, which is a lot of what the vagus nerve does. It's, send, it's sending information throughout the body about whether we feel safe or not and how to reconnect to ourselves. It also has a two-way highway between the gut and the brain. Um, so again, that information is just flowing all over the place. Okay. So some physiological things that are happening in the body. When we're in an environment that we feel safe and our body is giving those cues and the vagus nerve is receiving, there's that back and forth of information happening. Physiologically, our brain is chilled out and relaxed. The muscles in our middle ear are shifting in order to pick up a higher range of information of higher different frequencies that we can take in. Our throat is physically soft and open. Blood flow is able to move through the body with a sense of regulation and consistency. And the body will communicate its needs. It'll say, I'm hungry. This is what I'm hungry for. I have to go to the bathroom. I can't hold it or I can't hold it. When we think about emotionally and like when we're in um, conversation with each other, when we experience ourselves in a state of safety, our thoughts can go in so many different places. We can be curious. We can be considerate. We can be collaborative. We are really equipped to listen deeply to each other and not just deeply to each other, but deeply to ourselves in context and in conjunction with another human being. There is a sense of willingness and ease about bringing our voice into the world and sharing whatever it is that is true for us. And we can really hear those body cues, right? We can say, ooh, this is, this is a tough conversation for me. I actually need to go for a walk. Or I do want to have this conversation, but I'm probably going to need to eat a banana or get something to eat before we keep going. So the next state um, is when we experience a sense of threat in our environment. So Stephen Port just developed fight and flight. The fawn state is actually something that was developed by a marriage and family therapist named Pete Walker. Physiologically, the things that are happening in our body, regardless of which state we're in, are similar. So at this point, the vagus nerve is sending information that we have to do something because there's something in our environment that is making us feel unsafe. Generally speaking, the brain tends to go on fire. We're rapid fire. What can I do? What can I say? Et cetera. It's moving a lot. It's not so much taking things in, but trying to generate the strategy within ourselves. The muscles in our ears have actually shifted. So those middle muscles have moved so that they're actually listening for low grade sounds, kind of like a growl sound. In other words, we begin to scan the environment for threat. There can be a sense of constriction in our throat. 
blood is moving a lot faster through our body because the heart is saying we have to send as much blood as possible to the big muscle groups in the body so that we can take action and do something. Our breathing tends to get shallower and our bodily needs are paused. We no longer get hungry. We don't have to go to the bathroom because again, there are other things that our body has to do. Emotionally speaking, what's happening, right? So if we go into a fight state, it means that whatever it is that we are perceiving or experiencing as threat, we are going to move towards that thing and attack it. So we might get defensive, we might get a lot louder, we might get aggressive in our communication. If we go into a fight state, that is our body saying, that thing is really scary. I'm going to get us away from it as fast as we can. <laughs> So we might be the person extremely avoidant, not answering the text, not looking at the emails. Anytime your roommate is home, you are not going to be right. Wherever the conflict is, I'm gone. And lastly, when we're going into fawning or people pleasing, it's the idea that that thing is scary. I cannot get away from it. So the safest thing that I can do is I can make the scary thing calm down. Let me get rid of all of my needs, anything that the scary thing needs me to say or needs me to do in order for that scary thing to become regulated so that I can access safety again. Those are the behaviors that we begin to exhibit. And then lastly, we have the freeze state. So this is the state that we go in when our body is picking up the cues that there is a threat present, our body is assessing our skills and capacity. And it says, I cannot get you away from the situation. There is not a way for me to engage or make that thing go away in any way, shape or form. So what I am going to do is I am going to shut everything down. I am going to make it so that you feel nothing. So our brain might begin to feel like we're on ice. We're dissociating. We're checking out. We're not feeling. <clears throat> and a lot of times when people are coming out of a free state, there can be a sense of embarrassment and humiliation, disgust, a feeling like my body betrayed me. Why didn't I say something? Why didn't I do something? And I really, really like to remind us that our body is always trying to love us as much as it possibly can. That if we go into a free state, it is not because our body doesn't love us. It's because your body is saying, this is the strongest strategy I have to make it so that we survive what's here. Emotionally, we can have difficulty forming thoughts. It just feels like everything is a fog. It might be very difficult for you to even understand or articulate your needs. And then you may be saying and doing things which just don't make sense that feel incredibly confusing to you or you don't understand. I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna invite everybody to take a big breath. We'll remind folks, right? If you have a cup of tea with you or some water, you can have some of that. Miro is also available as emotional support if you need to pop out anywhere. And we'll just kind of check for questions. Is there anything of that that people would like me to review or explain in a clearer way? Okay, I'm going to keep us going. So for most of us, we don't experience conflict as a very safe space, right? We go into some state of activation. We're either fighting, we're avoiding the conflict, we're people pleasing, or we're just going into a free state and not really understanding what the heck is going on. Um, so the thing about safety for human beings, I'm going to pull this down so that you can see me more directly. And I'm going to invite you to do this with me. Um, I'm going to have you put one hand up like this and then one finger like this. So if you imagine that this hand is a newborn infant baby hand, and then this finger over here is like a grown-up adult finger. If you put a grown-up finger in a newborn baby hand, 
what is it that the baby hand will do? Yeah, it'll close. Because human beings are physiologically wired to belong to each other. This is how we access and experience safety. Giraffes come out of the womb and they are literally already walking, right? It takes us years to know how to be able to move or exist autonomously. Our skin is very, very thin. A cactus needle can kill us. A spider bite can kill us. It's only if we have access to other people, to a community who holds us and holds us with care that we actually get to experience a sense of safety. And even though, um, you know, we don't live, I don't walk around these days afraid that I'm going to bump into a cactus, physiologically, that's some really deep wiring. And there's still a sense of safety being when I am in a place where I am loved, wanted, and held. So coming back into this, right? We experience safety when we know that we belong. When we know that we belong somewhere is when we can access all of those healthier brain faculties and those skills that are actually really um, relevant and necessary for navigating conflict. And the other thing is that this state of belonging, true safety, one of the markers of that, the indicators, is when we're playing, because we will only actually play when we feel safe, when we feel like we will belong. We will only let our goofiness out, our awkwardness out, our <laughs> most wildest imaginations um, in places where we feel like it is safe to bring those pieces of us forward. So like, okay, if play is like sort of like the marker of belonging and belonging is the place of safety. And then that's where all the brain faculties in are coming. Then it had the image of like little lion cubs or like puppies, you know, when they're play fighting. Um, and those hits are real. Like they are scratching each other. They are clawing at each other. They are bumping heads, but they're doing it as practice they're doing it as a sense of how can we skill build with each other these things that we need to know how to do in order to be able to navigate the real world. And then I thought, ah, that's so interesting because then what if we could experience conflict as a form of play? Conflict is not actually this life or death situation that throws us out of belonging with each other, but rather the way that we engage with conflict is like, I'm batting you a little bit, you're batting me a little bit, and we're skill building alongside each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So taking us into what is it that play gives us access to? Um, and I think I'm actually gonna pause briefly and just in reference to the earlier slide, I have had some conflict in my life recently because it never goes away. And each time before I've had to go into one of these conversations, I have asked myself, how can I bring the most goofiest version of me? What is the most lighthearted version of me that I can bring into this conversation in order to demonstrate that our conflict is not actually distancing, but in a genuine invitation into connection? And it has been helpful. So some things about what it is that play gives us access to. One, it gives us access to quick recovery, right? When, we, when little people are playing and they have that hit to the head, they fall down, they are up again if the game is still going. So it allows us that kind of like bounce back. It gives us access to inherent creativity and all of the wisdom and genius that is within us. And then it really lets us do things repetitively. If you think about anything, there was this... Um, this quote that's been going around um, from a psychologist who's passed away, Karen Purvis, and she has shared, and it's actually, I'm going to share the quote thing, um, that it takes, I think, 400 repetitions of something to create a new synapse, to create a new neural pathway, unless the activity is done through play, in which case it only takes 10 to 20 repetitions. And I don't have, I went down a research rabbit hole um, and 
uh, Dr. Purvis's past, so I don't actually have like a source for that. So I can't, don't cite me on it. But what I will say, that's something that, again, like that's information that our body already knows when things are gamified, when things are fun, it is a lot easier to learn, which means it's a lot easier to consistently do. What is it that makes play possible? Number one, we have to know the rules of the game, right? I hate cricket. I will never play cricket. I will never watch cricket. I don't understand what's happening. I haven't touched a cricket bat since I was eight years old. I know you can't hit the wickets and then you run back and forth, but I have no idea what's going on. But if you put me in front of a basketball or on a basketball court, I am all over it. I know where the free throw line is. I know how to get up in the paint. I know where the, 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 the three point line is, you know, I will stand there and I will be your pick and roll because I love basketball. I understand all the rules. It's really, really fun to play. The same is true in conflict when we don't understand what kind of rules we're each coming with, what those needs are, it becomes harder to play with each other. So some examples of like, you know, a rule of conflict, it might be, you might be the type of person where if something happens, it's like, okay, I need one hour to be by myself in order to be able to come back to this conversation, right? Or another thing is I need it to be expressly stated that there's conflict happening, that we're, that you're angry at me. I don't need to know why you're angry at me. We don't need to resolve it all right now, but there's some degree, like I have to just hear that it's on the table and that I'm not making things up, right? We all have different rules or things that are important to us, parameters that make it easier for us to engage with conflict. We have to know who's playing. Um, <laughs> you can imagine, if in if you're playing some type of like team sport and then all of a sudden 50 other people rush the the court and are suddenly now you have to play with all those people it gets really confusing and really overwhelming and conflict again is very similar if you and i are in conflict and then all of a sudden your roommate is talking to me about the situation or telling me what i should or should not do it's really disorienting or vice versa if you and I are having conflict and it's like, actually, I really would like community to be involved and be present for it. Community also needs access to choice to say yes or no, I do or don't want to become engaged with this. We have to have clarity on who is it that's playing with us, who wants to be involved in this game. It's helpful when we're coming with comparable skill levels. So you've heard about my love of basketball. I promise you, if you are any good at basketball, playing with me will be terrible because I am terrible at basketball. So if you like playing with people who are really bad, cool. In the same way, we're all at different stages of how we've been conceptualizing conflict, unpacking our relationship to conflict, understanding how we want to be in communication. If you are someone who has been thinking about these things for three years, and then there's somebody else who's like, whoa, I can't go in that deep. Like, that's not fun for me because I'm just starting to have an understanding of what I need in conflict. I'm just being beginning to be able to articulate my needs. That dissonance in skill level can make things difficult. It's helpful if we have a good winner, a good loser, a good crowd. So if the winner is not going to be like, ha ha ha, you lost. <laughs> if the loser is going to be able to lose with grace. And also, if you think about like a stadium of people watching, there's a very big difference when people are rooting for somebody versus when people are rooting against somebody. When we are navigating conflict, there's always people watching us who are witnessing, who are alongside, right? We need a crowd of people who, whichever way the conflict goes, is really rooting for everybody to come out a winner, as opposed to sticking with this person is a total loser. And then lastly, there's no right or wrong. There's just what's fun. We can have different ways of playing. We don't have to all do conflict the same way. Um, and there can be some real sweetness in developing a sense of ownership of how is it that I like to play? Nobody else is wrong for what they do or don't like to do, but what is it that I love? And then how can I gravitate towards people who enjoy playing in a very similar way? 
So I'm gonna pause here for questions, anything that's coming up for folks. Okay. Then I'm gonna take us into our first journaling prompt, which is how do you behave when you are at your most playful? What do you love about the way you play? So we'll be here for about three minutes. I'm gonna put the timer up and we'll bring us back after this. Okay, I'm gonna bring us back. There's a couple questions in the chat thread. So I'm gonna speak to these and then we're gonna take our five minute break. Um, so there's a question of how do you engage and play with someone who doesn't have the same skill level? I think that really <laughs> varies. I think that uh, sometimes what happens in relationships, all different types of relationships, is that we get into a relationship and we discover that one person wants to play in one particular way and somebody else wants to play in a different particular way. And so I think there's some kind of like, um, it's a self-awareness thing of like assessing, am I willing to meet the other person where they're at? Do I have the capacity to meet the other person where they're at? And if I do or don't, how can I decrease judgment in order to either change my expectations in the relationship or to exit their relationship. So I think that's one thought that I'll share on that. And then there was another question of when navigating conflict with dissonance skill levels, what practices do you find helpful for lifting and naming those dynamics in ways that don't hierarchize those dynamics? How does skill sharing and learning fit into conflict and play? I think I might in this question, 
because it is a big one. Um, but it might be, a, and can I get a thumbs up from the DJ and team? Does this feel like a question that could come in at the end? Maybe. Okay. All right. Let's take our break here. Um, I'm going to toss up another timer so that folks can see it. Um, so we're going to take a break for five minutes, and then I'll dive us back into a little bit more.
I am going to bring us back. Thank you. I'm going to answer this question of, is skill always a requirement for play? Can we pick up skills through play as intuitive, intentional beings? My answer is going to be, yes, it is a requirement for play. And you already have skills. <laughs> it's not, right? We're always developing new skills. We're always creating new skills. So it's not that uh, we have to learn them. But sometimes it's just this thing of we have to remember that we have to find them or we have to name them. Um, but in the same way that like little people, right? Like different types of play. Can a two-month-old play tag? No, not yet. <laughs> but can a two-month-old play some version of peekaboo? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to take us... Here we go. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Shifting gears from the very gentle music that we just had. Are we ready? Here we go. Get ready, y'all. Get your gear on. Get ready to play because we are going in to conflict combat. Now, I will tell you. We're not actually going to play. So we're not gonna fight anyone. You don't have to do anything like that. But <laughs> what we're gonna be doing, I'm gonna be taking you through a few different players, a few different characters. You're gonna get to choose your player. And then we're gonna think about, okay, when we actually go into conflict, what are the ways that we're playing with each other? What works, what doesn't work? So, the first character that I'm going to introduce you to is the competitive pressure. Now, the competitive pressure comes into conflict with a whole ton of ease, speaking one's mind, really, really anchored in a right to have needs met. These are the skills, some of the strengths, right? The weaknesses of the competitive pressure is that they can ignore opportunities for slowness, and they can be very, very quick to cast judgment. The ways that the competitive pressure likes to play and also the skills that you will need to learn if you are if you have a competitive pressure in your life are strong and clear boundaries and also very, very direct communication. The next player I'm going to introduce you to is the dignified denier. So the dignified denier does not want to get involved in conflict whatsoever. They are incredibly rooted and also protective of their sense of self-respect. Self they really, really value precision and clarity. Some of the weaknesses of the dignified denier is that they can be very quick to isolate. And they're afraid of getting messy. They don't want to get dirty with all of the nonsense that conflict can entail. If you have a dignified denier in your life, a skill that you may want to learn is demonstrations of unspoken understanding, right? The dignified denier does, especially in the heat of conflict, doesn't want to have to talk about it, but really appreciates receiving gestures that you see them and that you understand them. And one of the things that I will just say I love about this character is that sometimes direct communication is placed as the gold standard and it's not. Effective communication is the gold standard, right? Different styles of communication work for different people. So we're not all trying to play the same way, but we're all trying to learn, okay, if I got you in my life, what is the way that I need to play with you? A profound pursuer. <laughs> this one is going to be the one who is like really, really invested in unpacking every element, every aspect of conflict, right? The strengths, they celebrate their commitment, they're invested in deep building. Some of the weaknesses, this one can become attached to hard work, talking about things forever and ever and ever, and can really, really, really drown in meaning making. If you have a profound pursuer in your life, one of the things that you're going to need to get good at is explaining the purpose of pausing and the purpose, right? Like what is the purpose of spaciousness? How does slowing down, taking a break um, actually contribute to healing the relationship? We don't have to go in all the time everywhere. 
the no needs nomad. <laughs> the no needs nomad is is rarely ever going to contribute to conflict. They also won't really. Um, <laughs> I one of the things I was thinking about is like you know this conflict that many people have had about like um, a roommate situation where there's dishes in the sink. The no needs nomad is never going to leave dishes in the sink. And they're also never, ever, ever, they're always going to always clean up your dishes as well. So they're going to do all of their work. They're also going to cover and make sure that all of your work is done as well. Um, now the strengths, deep consideration for others really prioritizes and values peace. The weakness, this one can become um, self-sacrifice becomes self-sabotage and can really begin to bake layer cakes of resentments, consistently putting away their own needs, um, and then establishes something that is going to start to build and build and build, and eventually either explode or just create some type of rift that is unable to be uh, bridged. If you have a no-needs nomad in your life, the thing you're going to want to learn how to do is to play with incredible gentleness, to play with incredible incredible softness, incredible openness in order to allow the no needs nomad to really come forward and tell you what they need. And lastly, we got the fast fixer. <laughs> this one really values efficient and timely care. They are an avid brainstormer. Um, some of the weaknesses, they are afraid to simply be present. They have a hard time with big emotions. So one of the things that can be helpful with the fast fixer is giving them concrete instructions. They're going to want to come in and try and fix everything, cut them off at the pass, right? I don't need your advice. I don't need you to tell me what to do. What I do need you to do is for you to just sit and breathe with me for three seconds before you give me your next thoughts. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to take us into a couple of journaling prompts and they're going to be shorter journaling prompts. <clears throat> so the first one is who are you? Right. And you might be a mashup of these characters. Um, we can drop the slide deck again into the, the, sorry, the chat thread. So the first invitation will be here for two minutes is choose your fighter. Who are you? there's a comment in the chapter which is very true of who i am depends on who i'm interacting with this is very true pick a scenario that you have in mind and work with that Okay, the next prompt I'm going to take you into is who do you typically find yourself playing with, right? Who do you typically find yourself playing with? And I will tell you if you are a competitive crusher, chances are you're playing with the no needs nomad because that's how the game goes. 
So I'm going to get us going for two minutes. Who do you typically find yourself playing with? I don't want to work in the garden. I just want to make a cake and bring a cake Okay, I'm going to be taking us into our next prompt. So the next one is how do your skills and styles of playing meet each other? How do your skills and styles of playing meet each other? So we'll be back in two minutes. Okay, and then the last one, where we'll again be here for two minutes. When you think about this game, not as a challenge to defeat someone, but as an invitation to play, what changes for you? Like what changes in the way you embody and imagine yourself stepping into this character? So we'll start for two minutes and we're going to be going into breakout rooms after this.
Right. So bringing folks back, we're going to be going into a breakout room discussion. I'm going to put the prompt up and um, we'll, the, the slides will get dropped in again so that you can take this with you. The invitation is to introduce yourself, your name, pronoun, your location, and then share insights and reflections which are emerging from these journaling prompts. So I'm going to toss it over to Victoria from here to put us out. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> um, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. How was this for folks? Okay. I think going to invite folks to share into the chat thread just one insight that you want to take away from your breakout room or that you want to share about yourself. Um, and also we'll toss it over to Karina from here. So as folks are dropping in their thoughts and their experiences in the chat, um, we're going to head into a 10 minute break in just a moment. Before that, I wanted to bring back up the question that was dropped into the chat earlier on during Minachi's uh, presentation. And it was from Amelia. And this question was one we wanted to invite back in because it's a larger question and one that we want to invite you all to hold between this gathering that we're in and the next one that we're going to have. So I'm gonna drop that chat in in a moment. And that question is about basically navigating conflict with different and dissonant skill levels. And the question was around what practices would be helpful for lifting and naming those dynamics in a way that doesn't make a hierarchy between the people in the conflict and also how skill sharing and learning fit into the conflict in play. So we're gonna bring this question back up for everybody. And then we're going to be heading into a 10 minute break. So as we head into that break, we want everyone to just be able to, um, you know, come back with uh, a nourishment if you need that, with a release if you need to do a bio break, but do what your body needs and come back in 10 minutes for us to finish up and move through the rest of our program. Thank you so much, Victoria, and welcome back to everyone. I hope you had a really good nourishing break. Um, I'm loving how alive and funny and engaged this chat is. Yeah, just seeing a lot of these shares rolling through about how the breakout rooms also felt like such a playful space and um, I think someone was calling their breakout room mates playmates, which I love, thinking of that breakout room as a playroom and, and what that means. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of shares that we will we'll come back to in a few moments when we have um, some open some open share time. Yeah, lots of lots of really good stuff in there rolling through. Um, but right now, wanted to um, take a few more moments just to have some space to reflect process, um, kind of express about everything that's happened today from, yeah, spending time with your own players, um, the, the players and types of, of other folks in your life. Um, also definitely hearing what some folks are sharing in the chat about the complexities of thinking about conflict in terms of archetypes, the kinds of things and connections and vulnerabilities that can open up in different um understandings or knowings that um, might invite you to come back to in yourself and also some of the limitations sometimes and um, but kind of holding all of that what it can shift to to come into this and bring curiosity and a sense of play so yeah I know I'm processing a lot and we'll come back to this um, after today too um, but right now 
um, we wanted to bring in these two prompts, which are prompts also that we'll return to over and over again um, in the different care circles that we'll be doing over the course of this year and into next year. Um, and also really calling back in that um, design justice principle number six that, that we started on that Karina named that Minachi brought in, um, kind of framing this whole conversation around our own our own lived experience and brilliance that we bring into design, design practice, and into conflict, um, into everything. So, so these questions will take about five minutes with these right now. I'll read them out first. Um, and yeah, feel free to respond to them in whatever way feels like accessible to you right now and feels right. If that means writing, journaling, moving, drawing, um, just kind of being in, in silence or in quiet. Yeah, whatever feels good. So the, the first question is, um, in what ways does this practice build upon your existing gifts and embody knowledge? In what ways does it invite you to stretch and explore? And the second question, what is this practice illuminating about what you need to be holistically resourced and cared for on a personal and collective scale? And yeah, so on the next uh, couple of slides in the slide deck, um, I think that slides like 51 to 54, um, but you'll see that there's, there's space for you um, to add directly into the slide deck if that's something you wanna do with like images, words, phrases, um, whatever. So, so yeah, so feel free to do that or to do it in your own space. Um, and we'll take about five minutes to do this and Victoria will play some gentle instrumentals for us while we do that.
invite us to come back slowly to the main group. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Miro. As a reminder, these slides are, are here for you. So if you want to come back to them afterwards at any time um, to visit other people's responses or to keep adding your own, um, yeah, they'll be there and you'll keep having access to them. Um, yeah, I love seeing all these responses roll through. It kind of reminded me of like sidewalk chalk and being on the playground and these slides being kind of the, that playground gravel or, or concrete um, and and everybody kind of drawing their own pictures and writing their own responses together. Um, but yeah, does anyone want to share any part of your response to, to either of these two questions? Um, feel free to, to come on camera, off camera, um, to, to unmute and speak it into the group or yeah, again, if you wanna put your responses in the chat, um, I'll read the ones that, that have read in front of them. So yeah, realizing it's a big shame, unfortunately, that while sometimes I'm in play, facilita play facilitator mode for others, I'm not actually playing and seeing lots of lots of resonance and lots of love for that comment um, and people also relating to that. Realizing how much fear of abandonment, of failure I'm holding, how to do some trust work, internal and external. Mm -hmm. Yeah, loving the visual additions. I'm chuckling about this meme with Moira Rose. Yeah, and again, yeah, these slides will be there. So going back and, and reading them or spending time with them um, on your own time after this gathering, um, super welcome. Before we move into a closing of today, we also wanted to revisit this kind of ongoing, ever evolving Care May Be document that we've been creating, adding to over um, our past few gatherings and which we'll keep returning to um, over the next couple of years. So this being sort of a reflection of our understanding that care is something that is hard to define or be many has many definitions and um, we're all bringing lots of different things to that word, to what care even means, what it looks like, looks like, feels like, um, yeah, how it shows up in any moment. So I um, wanted to take a couple of minutes to invite you to write your own version of a care may be so just how how would that how would you finish that sentence right now care may be um so we'll take a couple minutes to do that and then we'll do a bit of a a play experimentation with those different care may be statements that we're going to come up with right now so yeah two minutes to do a, a new care may be Sorry, just to clarify, oh. <laughs> it's like wow, sudden sudden music vibe change. I'm into it. Um, the <laughs> so for this care may be um, right now. You can just kind of write it um, wherever feels like easy for you, whether that's like really on a, on a scrap piece of paper or um, just in your own mind or on your computer or wherever. Um, and we'll do something with them all together in a moment.
inviting everybody back again into the room. I hate to interrupt this very gentle music. Um, and I'm wondering, actually, maybe Victoria, if you could stop sharing the screen just for a moment, uh, that would be okay. Um, yeah, love seeing those additions to the document. And yeah, so I wanted to try um, a, a chorus incantation practice that a few of us um, on the team, including Denise Shante and I have, have done before in different spaces and just seeing how this goes. Um, doing this over Zoom, there is definitely an element of, um, yeah, of play and experimentation that goes into it. Um, but basically I'll invite everybody um, in a moment to, to unmute at the same time and or to be in the chat at the same time. Um, and either adding in your care may be statement into the chat or speaking it um, out loud into the room at the same time. And I'll set a timer for say like about a minute. And in that minute, you can repeat the phrase as many times as you want um, within that period. So um, you might wanna just say it once and then let everybody else's statements kind of wash over you. Or you might wanna like say it and then listen and then say it a few more times. Um, me seeing if it changes each time you you kind of invoke it or speak it. Um, yeah, and or kind of putting it into the chat and, and also just being with what everybody is sharing and all the different expressions of care um, that exist here. Um, does that, yeah, does anyone have any, any questions about that? Or maybe a couple of people just throw up a thumbs up um, if that's making sense. And, ready to try. Okay, cool. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I'll set I'll set for like 90 seconds a timer. Um, and then inviting everybody to to share your care maybe. Starting starting now. Self-connection. Here, maybe reminding myself that I am safe with me. Here, maybe generative conflict. Care may be coming home to what we already know. Care may be imperfect at times. It's a practice that we can show up to differently depending on capacity and context, not something to be graded. Reading from the chat on behalf of D, care may be making your own safe space and creating an intentional ritual towards accessing your safety. A poem lived out in full. Thank you everyone. And I'll pass to Denise Shante to close us out. Thank you. I'm so grateful for the creation of this document. One of the things that we'll be able to come through, what you all see it before your responses from today has come from our last two gatherings. And so as this grows and lives and breathes, I just send gratitude um, for your willingness to respond and reflect on, on what care is and the multiple definitions and dimensions that care can have. We are at our announcements and closing part of this section. 
want to shout out, there are some questions about where can I sign up for the next session? When is it happening? So all of our series um, for each theme, we have four pod themes. This is the first one. It will be two parts. So the Care Circle today is part one. Part two is the practice space that continues framing conflict as play with Minachi. And it's happening on September 26, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. That link uh, will be dropped in the chat or you can directly register for the Zoom or you can find it on our September Care Pod events page. In this practice space, we're going to practice conflict through role plays, deepening in the somatic listening that Minachi has brought forward and that we've been experiencing and building on today. You're going to have the opportunity to participate with small group role play activities with some variations of what that looks like through text, verbally communicating, being on off camera. So we're gonna have the opportunity to integrate that theoretical understanding with the embodied relationship to conflict that we want in our real lives through this idea of role play, which continues to bring in this, um, the energy of, of what's grounding and what's also a little light uh, and intuitive for us to move through. I wanna shout out a reminder. We have launched care honorariums for DJN local nodes and working groups. So if you are a member or a part of a local node or working group, we are extending 10 $500 honorariums for you to plant seeds of care within your community. So that what's happening here goes beyond this virtual time space and into the circles and networks that you have around you. Some examples, um, we share some of this in that form that will be dropped in the link. It could be you hiring a somatics facilitator to lead a session for your node or group. You could be creating a community dinner, hiring a local herbalist to teach a class that meet the needs of your group. These are just a few examples. And if you're not a member, then definitely check out the Design Justice page that you will find yourself through in our follow-up email and also in the links that we shared so that you can see what's happening. There may be a local node or working group in your city or someplace nearby that you might want to join because we're also extending these honorariums next year as well. And the last thing is we will have a follow-up email that shares the links and resources that came from today. We'll also direct you to the page where you can sign up for the newsletter. Some folks have been asking, like, how do I find out what's happening next? Everything about the, the, the Design Justice Network is gonna be shared in one newsletter. Um, so please make sure that you are a part of it and you'll hear all of the CarePod events that are emerging. And there is one more thing, the arena. We started this, a lot of people seem to be enjoying it. It's this way for us to archive everything that's happening. So you can learn more about the lineages of the pods, also you know, the formation, what's happening, ways that you can tap into the tools and resources through that arena page. Um, every time that a session happens, we post the video there in addition to the email that you'll get. But this is just one place that will hold um, everything that unfolds and is shared within our CarePod experiences. So we will take a moment to get out of our screens. to see each other and to close and have a moment to share out loud or invite in the chat, just a word, a phrase or emoji about how you're feeling as you're leaving the space. Thank you so much, Kate. <laughs> so much work can I do? See the heart emojis too. Thank you. 
I'm also going to invite our team and any like vocalized gratitude as we're closing today before we see you next week or the 26th, sorry. If any of our team members want to say goodbye in our farewells. Yeah, just thank you all for being here. And yeah, excited to share space again, live or async with those of you who are joining for practice space. And yeah, to feeling like the time just flew by um, kind of in a curious and, and caring community. So yeah, thanks to everyone. Feeling grateful and thank you all for all of the energy you brought in and the openness today. Yeah, echoing the gratitude and just really enjoying um, co-creating these spaces with all of you who are attending. Um, it's really beautiful to see it evolve each time. Thank you. We're grateful to be here and thanks for putting up with the uh, Spotify ads. <laughs> Yes, thank you to our interpreters. Thank you for all the affirmations and the emotional support and the questions. Yeah. All right, appreciate you all. We'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>